Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Meryl Hoopengardner, the president of National Trust Community Investment Corporation. Thank you for joining us today for our inaugural webinar. Um, we are doing a three-part series talking about tax credit financing to support the redevelopment and rehabilitation of historic properties across the country. And today we'll be talking about some of the basics and the lingo that you need to learn to know about how to access tax credit financing for the Federal Historic Tax Credit and the New Markets Tax Credit. And we welcome you to join us for future installments of this webinar series where we'll be exploring case studies on prior transactions we've used and getting into more of the structuring details along the way. So I'm joined by several of my colleagues here at NTCIC. Laura Burns, who's our Community Impact Compliance Manager, who's going to walk us through these two different federal tax credit incentives. My colleague, William Theaterlein, who's a project manager and is here to answer all your technical questions on putting these credits together. Um, and my colleague, Mike Palian, who's our senior marketing specialist, who's going to moderate us as we go along and make sure we don't have any technological hiccups. You will be able to access this as a recording after the fact, or if you have friends or family or colleagues who had hoped to participate and weren't able to during this time slot today will be available to them after the fact as well. So for those of you who are not familiar with NTCIC, we are the for-profit tax credit investment arm of the National Trust for Historic Preservation. We were created in 2000 to be a historic tax credit syndicator. We've been involved since then in doing over $1.4 billion of tax credit investments in historic rehab, particularly in low-income communities, together with the historic and the new markets tax credit. So we're going to be talking a little bit from our experience, both as a tax credit investor and also as a subsidiary of the National Trust and the programmatic work that our parent does and our colleague, the National Main Street Center, who's our sister subsidiary under the National Trust umbrella and the work that both the Trust and Main Street are doing to do preservation work in communities across the country. So I'm going to hand it off to Laura, who's going to walk, it, walk us through how some of these credits work and might be a benefit for redevelopment projects in your community. Thank you, Meryl. Uh, as Meryl said, I'm the Community Impact Compliance Manager for the National Trust Community Investment Corporation. I know that's a long name, so from now on, I'm just going to use the acronym NTCIC. And speaking of acronyms, I just want to warn you ahead of time that the tax credit world is full of acronyms. So you'll be learning a lot of them today. But before I talk about tax credits, I want to just expand on um, the introduction to NTCIC that Merrill started. Um, we are a mission-driven organization that finances sustainable economic development nationwide by providing tax credit syndication, technical assistance, and advocacy for the preservation of historic properties with a focus on properties in low-income communities. In fact, over 92% of all our investments are located in a low-income community. We also are governed by a 10-member board of directors that consist of current or former National Trust trustees, and 60% of our board members represent low-income communities, either as a resident of a low-income community or an employee or board member of a community development organization. Many of you may be wondering at this point how I'm defining low-income community. Well, I'm defining it based on census tracts where the poverty rate is at least 20% or a median family income that is 80% or less of the statewide median family income. Where did I get this definition? This is how it's defined by the New Markets Tax Credit Program, the tax credit program that was created by the Community Renewal and Tax and Relief Act of 2000 and which prompt, prompted the National Trust to form NTCIC, a taxable entity take advantage of the program. The New Markets is administered by the Community Development Financial Institutions Fund, which is part of the Treasury, which is part of the Treasury Department. NTCIC is also a Qualified Community Development Entity, or CDE, another one of the acronyms I mentioned. Because New Markets is a tax credit, it is a competitive program which means that the tax credits are only awarded to CDEs. And to be a CDE, 
you must be a taxable as a domestic corporation or partnership, have a primary mission to serve or invest in low-income communities, and be accountable to residents of those low-income communities through your governing board. Thirdly, we're a tax credit syndicator, which is an intermediary between investors who have capital and developers rehabilitating historic buildings and need capital. So I'm going to start with a general discussion about tax credits because there are many different kinds of tax credits at both the state and federal level. These tax credits are, are designed to encourage and reward certain types of investment and development that are considered beneficial to the economy, the environment, or to further a purpose of a particular, of a particular state or the federal government. Tax credits lower the amount of taxes owed to a federal or state government dollar for dollar. So this attracts investors with large tax liabilities who are interested in lowering those taxes. Think big banks and insurance companies. They provide a capital investment in exchange for tax credits. Tax credit syndicators like NTCIC connect investors with projects that qualify for tax credits. NTCIC is an experienced tax credit syndicator of the investment tax credit or solar tax credit, which is received for installing a solar energy system. Low-income housing tax credits, or LIHTC, which are used to finance the construction or rehabilitation of low-income affordable rental housing. Historic tax credits, as you know, which encourage the rehabilitation and reuse of historic buildings. And the New Markets Tax Credit, which provides an incentive for investment in low-income communities. We will be focusing on the Historic and New Market Tax Credit for this webinar. But all tax credits are not created equal. They incentivize different outcomes, as we've already discussed. They ad they're administered by different agencies. And they are taken over a different period of time, resulting in a different compliance and recapture period and requirements. Looking at tax credits in the most basic sense, let's say you have a Main Street Development LLC that just purchased an old, vacant, three-story building in a commercial corridor. The developers think the best reuse of this building will be a ground floor retail with residential above. Let's assume the project developer fulfills the requirements necessary to receive some type of tax credit allocation. The developer doesn't have a personal need for the tax credits and wants to exchange them for equity. They engage an investor and get cash. If only it was that simple. So now let's focus on the two specific tax credit programs, historic tax credits and new markets tax credits, starting with historic, or HTCs as they'll be referring to them. In a very brief history, the HTC was first enacted in 1978 and became a permanent part of the tax code in 1970, 1986. However, as we learned in 2017, anytime there is a tax overhaul, the historic tax credit is in danger of being eliminated. Luckily, it was saved and continues to be part of the tax code, but with some changes. I won't go into those, into what those changes are for purposes, for time purposes. So. We have the federal HTC, which is a 20% 20 20 tax credit for certified historic structures. These are buildings listed on the National Register of Historic Places or a build, building that contributes to a historic district. The National Park Service and the State Historic Preservation take care of the preservation aspects of the HTC process. There are also 35 states that have a state historic tax credit. While not all state tax credits are the same, a state HTC adds significant value and interest to projects located within that state. So, how do HTCs work? To generate HTCs, property owners must undertake a substantial rehabilitation of a certified historic structure with an eligible end use. At this point, you might have a building in mind, and you may want to ask if it is a contributing part of a historic district, or is it individually listed on the National Register? Does the plan to adhere to the Secretary of Interior's does the project plan to adhere to the Secretary of Interior's standards during rehabilitation? And will the end use be income producing? Will it be retail, office, 
hotel, or even apartment? And will it be a substantial rehabilitation where the QREs, or Qualified Rehabilitation Expenses, will be more than $5,000 or the adjusted basis of the building during a 24-month measuring period, or in some cases, a 60-month measuring period. That was a lot, so let's start unpacking what I just covered. First, the adjusted basis calculation. So if you're trying to rehabilitate a historic building, you will more than likely spend over $5,000. So what is the adjusted basis? Adjusted basis is typically the purchase price, which is building in the land, minus the cost of the land, minus the cost of depreciation, plus any capital improvements that have been made since the purchase. So if you haven't engaged your accountant, now would be a good time to consult them. Now that you or your accountant has calculated the adjusted basis, ask yourself, have you started the MPS application process? Does your building perhaps already have a part one, where it's a certified historic structure or it's part of a historic district? Do you have an idea of the rehabilitation work that needs to be done? Have you submitted a part two that describes the condition of the building and that planned work? If so, you have, um, have you also started to calculate those qualified rehabilitation expenses or QREs? You may be asking, well, what are QREs? Well, they are the tax credit eligible development costs, and they are used to calculate the amount of the HTC that the project could get. So what counts? Hard costs such as construction, electrical, and plumbing costs. Some soft costs like architectural fees, uh, construction period interest, and taxes. What doesn't count? Acquisition costs, leasing expenses, and new construction. So, Laura, sometimes when we are talking about how the historic tax credit works with legislators, mm -hmm. we simplify it, but it's almost like a dollhouse. So if you pick up your house up off the ground, you turn it upside down, and you give it a shake, the stuff that falls out, all your personal property, mm -hmm. your tables, your chairs, your wardrobe, whatever else, that stuff falls out, that's not eligible for the credit. Mm. The stuff that sticks to the building, um, including the money you spent to get stuff to stick to the building, like on your construction period interest, that stuff gets to stay. So sometimes just thinking about what's going to stick and what's going to fall out um, might be the way that developers who are joining us can think about, are they going to be able to meet that substantial rehab test definition? Because Congress was really looking to see that folks would spend a concentrated amount of money, unlike the house I live in where you're constantly doing fixer-uppers every year. Um, this is not just supposed to be your personal money pit. This is something that you're going to do a pretty major uh, batch of work over this period of time to do a significant retrofit, not just little fixes. Right. Those QREs have to be more than that adjusted basis you, you counted as well. So, at this point, you've probably determined whether or not your project is eligible, and we're going to say it's eligible for the historic tax credit. So how do you um, calculate these tax credits, and how do you get your investor equity from this, these tax credits? To determine the amount of tax credits, you multiply the QREs that you've already determined by 20%, and that's your tax credit. An investor typically pays less than $1 uh, per credit for the realized benefit. And based on the credit and the investor pricing, you can then determine the potential HTC equity that can go into your project. Technically, the HTC is generated when the building is placed in service or receives its certificate of occupancy, or its first certificate of occupancy. And the credits are earned over a five-year period. <clears throat> Excuse me. However, investors typically schedule equity payments over the development and construction period. And we have here NTCIC's a typical pay schedule that we see. After the project places in service, there is a five-year compliance period that begins, um, that begins during this time. And the tax credits can be recaptured if any material alterations are made to the building 
or if there is a transfer of ownership. This is what NTCIC's asset management team does after the project has placed in service. While no one wants recapture, the historic tax credit recapture amount does decrease by approximately 20% each year. So it's not as punitive as other tax credits that we'll learn more about later. For the sake of time, I'm not going to be going over the structuring of a historic tax credit deal today. We'll leave that to our professionals. Um, and that will be covered in our second webinar by our accounting and legal partners. And I do want to be sure to cover as much about the New Markets Tax Credit Program since I know this may be the first time that some of you have heard about this program. And this tax credit is very different from the historic tax credit. But before I go into how the New Markets Tax Credit process works, let me also give you a brief history of the program. We sort of went over it a little bit that it was established in 2000 and it had bipartisan support from Congress and continues to have bipartisan support. We mentioned it was administered by the Community Development Financial Institution Fund. But we didn't mention that it is not a permanent tax credit like the historic tax credit. In fact, over the past 19 years, Congress usually extends the program every year or every other year, except in 2015, the PATH Act of 2015 did provide a five-year extension through 2019. And as you may know, this is 2019. So if Congress does not extend or make this program permanent, there will be no more application rounds for the tax, tax credit after the calendar year 2019 round. However, I want to note that both the House and the Senate recently introduced bipartisan bills that was last Tuesday to make the tax credit permanent. Why is the New Market Tax Credit important? Because it encourages investments in low-income communities that have traditionally had poor access to capital. The New Markets Tax Credit is awarded by the to its community development entities and with the goal of spurring economic development in those low-income communities that have lacked access to capital. The CDEs have a lot of reporting to do to the CDFI fund and as a result, the projects or qualified active low-income community businesses, qualified fees, must report those community impacts to the CD on an annual basis, in addition to certifying that they remain a qualified active low-income community business. I warned you about the acronym. There's more to come. So how do new market tax credits work? Well, the first step is the city of, and, and why is this important for you to understand how they work? Well, the first step is the CDFI fund announces the opening of an allocation round. Currently, the CDFI fund has $3.5 billion in tax credit, uh, credits available per round. Once the round is announced, the clock starts to tick on the application, which is usually due around 60 days after the announcement. So it's a pretty quick turnaround. And once the applications have been submitted to the CDFI fund, they review and score the applications and give allocation authority to CDEs based on the score of the application and the CDE's track record for deploying awards. If I, mentioned, if I haven't mentioned it before, this is a very competitive application. Take the calendar year uh, 17. There was 20, 230 applicants or CDEs that apply and only 73 received an award. That's only 32% of applicants who applied for the program. And the application process is intense. Hundreds of hours of staff time. It consists of five parts, five exhibits, 44 questions. And um, as a potential project looking for new market tax credit allocation, I just want to note two of the most important parts. Part one, the business strategy, and part two, the community outcomes section of this. The business strategy is important because this is where a CDE is going to discuss the activities they engage in, real estate activities or just operating businesses. They're going to describe any innovative investments um, that they're willing to do and committing to do, such as investments 
that are $2 million or less. And it will also discuss if the CBE will do equity products or just debt products. So the CDE, the business strategy of that CDE will affect what they can provide to their borrowers for investments. But the most important part is part two of the application, the community impacts and outcomes. This is the part of the application that requires CDEs to quantify projected outcomes from their pipeline and from their existing projects, which is why it's important for projects to report annually. These outcomes include job information, community goods and services provided, environmental outcomes, and many more, as you can see from the screen. The CDE's process for evaluating community benefits um, is very important. If a CDE wins a tax credit award, they enter into an allocation agreement to comply with not only the new market program requirements, but to make sure that they are generally, generally consistent with the community outcomes that they discussed in the application. So let's think about our Main Street Development LLC project example. We have determined that the building qualifies for historic tax credits, but now we want to know if it qualifies for new market tax credits. The first step is, is the project located in a new market tax credit eligible census tract? That brings us back to that low income community definition I discussed earlier. But as I said, in the competitive process, you want to make sure that a CDE doesn't have a, um, a more severely distressed census tract as a requirement. This is a deeper poverty rate, poverty rates of greater than or equal to 30%, or um, a lower AMI at less than or equal to 60%, or an unemployment rate that is at least 1.5 times the national average. As a project, you're probably asking yourself, well, how do I know if I'm in a new market tax credit eligible census tract? Well, the CDFI fund has a map tool you can use. We put the website here, it's cdfifund.gov, and just go to their tools section, and you'll be able to put in the project address and see if you're in a new market tax credit census tract. For real estate projects, we also want to know what type of tenant businesses will be at the project. This isn't just for our community impact question, but it's to make sure that there are no ineligible businesses planned. These are also known as thin businesses. They include golf courses, country clubs, racetracks, liquor stores, and certain farming business. We'll also want to know that, yeah, we'll also want to know if it will have residential units. The new market tax credit is meant to be for commercial uses, but mixed use projects are very common in commercial corridors. So does this mean no residential at all? Well, no. A building can not have more than 80% of its total gross income coming from residential rents though. So this is something that needs to be looked at and worked out during underwriting to ensure that the project remains in compliance during the seven year compliance period. Additionally, if you have residential units, you must set aside at least 20% of these units as rent restricted or income restricted to households earning 80% or less of AMI. And in anticipated and in anticipation, sorry, of any questions, you'll always have to round that number up as far as units go. So a CDE will also want to know well, what kind of impacts are you expecting at your project? It doesn't have to be everything, but we are going to ask questions such as, how many jobs are you anticipating to create, both permanent and construction? Will these jobs be quality? Will they pay a living wage? Will they offer benefits like health insurance and paid time off? And will they be accessible jobs, entry-level jobs to low-income people? Will there be goods and services provided? Will your program have a healthcare facility or a workforce development program? Will you have a commercial good like a grocery store or a pharmacy in a low-income community? Will there be minority representation? Will your building have flexible lease rates and terms to locally owned businesses, minority owned businesses, women owned, or nonprofit businesses? 
Are you planning any environmentally sustainable outcomes at your project? We're talking about historic rehabilitation projects. What's the amount of reuse and recycling materials? Are there going to be new green technologies put in place? How does your project fit into the broader community plan? What kind of community engagement took place during this project planning? We'll also want to know what the current and anticipated sources of financing are. This is important. Everyone's building a capital stack. We'll want to know if you have bank debt, if you're a nonprofit sponsor, are you going through a capital campaign? Are you receiving grants? Are you getting historic tax credit equity? The reason for this is we want to know the sources and we also want to show that but for the new market tax credit, this project would not be financially feasible. This can be demonstrated through covering a funding gap or showing that you're providing reduced rates for locally owned businesses or you're trying to attract a key tenant like a grocery store in a USDA food desert. And we also want to know how ready are you? How shovel ready is the project? Do you have site control status? Are entitlements going? And where are you in your NPS process? So just to see this a little bit visually, I know a lot of us are visual learners. We have a CDE who has won an allocation award. You, as a project, have provided them with information about what you want to do with your project. You're located in a low-income community, and you believe that there's community outcomes and impacts um, that are important for this community. So the CDE goes and takes your project to an investor to see if they're interested in investing. Here's a review of the acronyms. I warned you. We've already talked about the LIC, the Low Income Community. We've talked about the CDE, the Community Development Entities. But we haven't quite talked about the Qualified Equity Investments, or QEIs, or the Qualified Low Income Community Investment, the QLICI, or the QualicB, the Qualified Active Low Income Community Business. So basically, tax credits, new market tax credits are a CDE using a QEI to make QLICI in a Qualic B that's located in an LIC. That was simple, right? Maybe not. Here, here it is in a little bit more visual format for you. Again, an allocation award goes to the CDE. The CDE gets a QEI, and that QEI is put in as a QLICI to the Qualic B. But how do you calculate the value of the new market tax credit? Well, first, it's determined by how much tax credit allocation that CDE is willing to put into your project. And it is based on the seven-year compliance period. The investor receives 5% of that QEI and tax credit during years one through three, then receives another 6% of the QEI and credit during years four through seven. So this results in a tax credit that is approximately 39% of the QEI. Again, we'll show some visuals to help. So what I sort of just explained is that for a $10 million QEI, a CDE will give an investor $3.9 million in tax credit? That doesn't make business sense. So let's see how it really works. First, we determine what new market tax credits are available. We've determined that it's $3.9 million based on a $10 million QEI. When we take the project to the investors, we, they determine how much they're willing to pay for the tax credit. And similar to HTCs, this is typically less than a dollar. And right now it's in the low to mid 80s. You take the tax credits um, that are available, multiply it by the investor pricing, and you get the new market tax credit equity. But I still haven't explained about that $10 million QEI. So here is a leverage structure that's typically used. So we see that assuming that the tax credit investor wants to pay $0.82 cents for the $3.9 million in tax credit, 
they're willing to put in $3.2 million in equity. So they'll invest that in a project investment fund. The other part of that $6.8 million needs to come from the leveraged lender in the form of a leveraged loan. Well, how do we get this leveraged loan? This is where your other sources of financing and capital can come into play. If you have a bank loan, if you have equity and cash as a sponsor, or if you're raising capital campaign funds, these can all be invested into the leveraged lender and used as part of the leveraged loan. As a result, the $6.8 million leveraged loan and the $3.2 million tax credit equity equals the $10 million QEI that's invested in the CDE. Investments must be designated as a QEI and reported to the CDFI funds and the IRS within 60 days. There's a lot of requirements and a lot of timing issues with the new market tax credit. A CDE must also use substantially all of the QEI to make a qualified low-income community investment, or QLICI, in a Qualic B. What does substantially all mean? It means 85%. However, again, we come back to that competition, most CDEs pledge to invest 95% or higher. So, what about the value to the project or quality B? Well, typically, CDEs make two debt policies to a quality B, a quality A loan that reflects the leverage loan amount, and a quality B loan that reflects the tax credit equity. Both Quilicis typically have below market interest rates and flexible financing features. However, both interest rates for the Quilicis need to be calculated based on the debt service payments that are needed for the leverage loan over that seven years. And again, this is where our accountants come into play. So, following this, we have a $6.8 million leverage loan and a $3.2 million tax credit equity going into the investment fund. That fund makes a $10 million QEI to the CDE. The CDE invests 100% in this case of their QEI into the Qualic B, even I'm getting messed up with these acronyms, <laughs> in the form of two QLICs, 6.8 and 3.2. Going back up annually, the Qualic B will make annual interest payments, or if you happen to have equity Qualic cash flow. And over time, the CDE allocates the $3.9 million in tax credit to the tax credit investor. So I told you there's a lot of requirements. And we're almost to the end of this, but I wanted to mention, because a Qualic B is the project, that a Qualic B must meet all of these requirements, and annually, they must certify that they continue to meet these 50% gross income test, a tangible property test, and the services performed test. Also, a Qualic B must generate revenue within three years. But again, this is going a little into the weeds, and we'll talk more about that with our legal experts next week, or ne at the next webinar. So back to the value of the new market tax credit, because I've told you a lot about the requirements, how strict the compliance is, um, all the reporting requirements, seven years of compliance, and I haven't mentioned this yet, there's a risk of recapture for the full tax credit amount. So we're really making sure we follow our compliance requirements and reporting requirements. So what does the quality B get for following all the rules and getting a new market tax credit investment? Well, they get below market interest rates for seven years with flexible financing terms. And at the exit of the new market tax credit transaction, the Quilicki B loan can be converted into Qualic B equity for a nominal amount. So let's look at this structure again. So at the end of the seven year compliance period, there's an exit strategy and potentially and more likely 
that Quality B, or 3.2 million, can be converted into equity at the Quality B level. So, how can organizations like NTCIC assist historic preservation and community development in your Main Street communities? As a tax credit syndicator, we provide guidance to developers and individuals who are seeking tax credits for historic rehabilitation. We evaluate the specifics of development projects and identify additional sources of capital if available. We connect individuals to investors that are actively seeking historic projects, and we support the projects through the ongoing compliance period from financial closing to exit. NTCIC has been syndicating HTCs since 2000. We have a national footprint with over in over 35 states. Our range of investments are less than 1 million to greater than 20 million, but the average equity is 8 million. As a community development entity, we are actively seeking projects for the new market tax credit allocation. We help guide you through the allocation process, and we offer products that directly support smaller scale real estate development projects located in Main Street communities. We do this through the Irvin Henderson Main Street Revitalization Fund, and we're actively seeking projects for, for this fund. We have a lot of experience, and we're very proud of our New Market Tax Credit experience. We have won 11 rounds in the New Market Tax Credit allocation. We are also a pioneer for twinning, an industry term for combining the historic tax credit with the new market tax credit. We have a variety of asset classes, including mixed use, community facilities, hospitality, office, and workforce development. I know I went through a lot, um, so I'm ready for any questions, or is William ready for questions that have come through? So, Laura, while we open up the phone line for folks to pepper you and William with questions, I think one common one that we get is, is, is it true that with historic tax credit, you can get it as of right if you follow all of the requirements to make sure your building's historic and you, you know, just go through the process properly. But with new markets, it's very competitive. So you don't automatically get it and you don't automatically get what matches your project cost, you will only be able to get what's available. Is, can you flesh that out a little bit more for folks, what those two key differences are and how the mechanism of the credit works? Sure. Um, the historic tax credit is based on the building. And as you sort of mentioned, it's, it's what the QREs are going to be at that building. For the new market tax credit, um, the CBEs are competitive. We're looking for um, impactful projects in low-income communities. Um, and so we're looking for a variety of projects. So our average allocation size is 8 to 10 million. Um, and we, you know, we're lucky enough uh, to win approximately 60 million in our last allocation. So that's a lot of projects um, that we can do. And so it's very competitive for the projects as well. So when I went over the community impact, we really want intake forms to be filled out as completely as possible and to really be thought about so we can score and select projects. Right, because there's competition happening both between us and the mm -hmm. CDFI fund when we apply that we're able to say that we're a good steward of this federal resource and then we're the ones that aggregate it and make investment decisions related to, to projects. So right. I think we were oversubscribed, what, 10 to 1 in the last round of the intake forms that we received. And that's part of what prompted us to create the small deal fund set aside so we can ensure that there's a level playing field for small projects and big projects trying to access new market tax credit financing. Mm -hmm. Mike, do we have questions from yes. folks on the line that we can ping William? Absolutely. With? Um, so first of all, we will be providing a recorded copy of the webinar along with the uh, presentation handouts as well uh, following this webinar. 
Um, so it seems like we have received several questions uh, regarding opportunity zones um, coming into play. Uh, two questions have been, um, can you use opportunity zone funds to be part of the leverage? And or um, can you discuss opportunity zones and potential for twinning? That's great. Uh, great question. We also were part of another webinar with our colleagues at the National Trust and National Main Street Center back in January, and we can put folks into the, uh, send them copies of that webinar so you can get more details on opportunity zones. In a quick nutshell, it has a lot of attributes that look like new markets. Uh, opportunity zone investments enable folks to raise money from investors who have capital gains and use those capital gains to invest in businesses or projects that are located in qualified opportunity zones. Like new markets, that definition is tied to the low-income community definition that Laura mentioned, but only 25% of low-income communities are eligible for the investment. Opportunity zones also don't have a subsidy involved. You get a tax discount and then tax relief but the money is not subsidized in the same way. So as Laura talked about, historic and new markets have an exit strategy that ensures that the equity stays permanently with the project. With an opportunity zone investment, only equity investments can be made, but it's equity where investors are expecting both a return of their capital and a return on their capital. So to the question about whether it can be leveraged, Mechanically, the answer is no. An opportunity zone investment has to be equity, so you can't make an equity investment as a leveraged loan or you would mess up the allocation of new markets tax credit. Um, so you may be able to put these dollars in side by side. It may be possible that an investor who wants both new markets benefits and opportunity zone benefits could twin those investments. So folks are looking for some regulatory clarity from the IRS that's expected really any day now on whether some of those structuring options will be possible. Okay, uh, next question we have received. Uh, with the tax cut bill of 2017, the payout of HTCs was expanded over a set period. Do you foresee this changing back? Thank you, that's an excellent question. So the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 20, <coughs> excuse me, 2017 made a couple changes to the historic tax credit. Most importantly, the historic tax credit still exists as a permanent part of the tax code, and we're still able to monetize it with third-party investors. So the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act did nothing with regards to limiting a project's ability to monetize the tax credit. One thing that did change is in prior years, you used to be able to claim the historic tax credit in the year the building was placed in service. So an investor on their tax return would be able to claim the historic credit when the building finished. The thing that changed under the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act is that it now the credit must be claimed in five equal installments over over five years when once the project is placed in service. So one fifth each year for five years. And we do not foresee this changing anytime soon, just given the I guess, complexity associated with tax reform in general. So that is why we think it'll stay a five year credit. One thing I'll add to that is that um, in NTCIC's role as chair of the Federal Historic Tax Credit Coalition, we're involved in putting together draft legislation for this year that will be coming out in the next couple of weeks that would make some improvements and enhancements to the historic tax credit. We are often asked whether we're going to be able to undo what was done in tax reform but there's very little interest in Congress right now on totally undoing decisions that were just made in 2017. So we're taking a different approach of restoring the value, but through some other mechanisms that would, for example, eliminate the basis adjustment requirement that you'll learn more about in the second webinar series um, and do some other things that would improve the value and likely get us back to the same tax credit pricing we had pre-tax reform. Great. Uh, the next question that's come in, with NNTC, traditionally, haven't those funds been more focused on larger cities? Are they competitive for smaller communities? So each CDE that participates in the program has kind of a different 
type of project they'd like to do. And some of those can be geographically focused. So certain CDEs might say, we're only going to do projects in the state of Texas, or certain CDEs might do projects all over the country. In terms of large cities versus rural communities or other areas, the, the new market tax credit traditionally has, has maybe been focused in larger cities as a result of just the market, but that's not to say that there's not CDEs that don't have a set aside to do projects in rural communities or in Main Street communities. And it's part of the reason why we established our Main Street Small Deal Fund is to go after and find the projects that can benefit from new market tax credits that maybe aren't aware of it or how the monetization process works and so that we can you know, find and work with these impactful projects. Just because of their zip code doesn't mean they're not important projects. And this also the new market tax credit statute requires that total of 20% of the new markets allocation is deployed into non-metro communities. Uh, one question we've received, uh, how can I tell if my building is eligible for the historic tax credit program? Sure, so you might have a building that's in your main street and it could be on a local register or locally historic or everyone just feels like it's just a really old building so maybe it qualifies. But this way that you can tell that it can use the historic tax credit is that it's a federal program. So the building has to be either one, individually listed on the National Register of Historic Places or two, be a contributing building in a National Register Historic District. And one, so if it's individually listed, you could look it up on the internet on the MPS website. Uh, if it's in a contributing building, you could also look up the Historic District's nomination, see if your building is included in that. And then finally, you could submit a Part 1 application to the National Park Service, and they will give you the official thumbs up or thumbs down on whether or not your building is considered a certified historic structure. Are there any strategies a 501c3 can utilize to take advantage of HTCs for a rehab project? Absolutely. So this gets into maybe more of the 201 than the 101 in terms of monetizing tax credits associated with a nonprofit. But there are ways for a nonprofit to monetize the historic tax credit. So if you think um, in a very basic sense, think of a historic theater. Maybe it's friends of the local theater is the 501c3 that owns it. They are able to effectuate a structure that allows them to, through a series of leases and operating agreements, not to get too technical, that allows them to monetize the historic tax credits that would be associated with said theater. And at the end of the day, still allows the theater to operate the building as a nonprofit. So the people that come to the theater to see, so they are none the wiser that this historic tax credit structure may exist. It's really a function on the accounting side, on their books. So, but there's certainly ways for 501c3s to utilize historic tax credits and or new market tax credits. So if you have any follow-up questions on that, feel free to email us and we could follow up individually. This is also one of the areas where we're working with Congress to get some more flexibility in the tax exempt use rules. Um, there are particular challenges for uh, nonprofits who've previously owned and operated the space that they want to rehab. It's much easier for people to do a rehab if they're taking a vacant building and putting a nonprofit use into it. So the Historic Tax Credit Coalition is working in Congress this year to get flexibility for additional types of projects. Um, one thing to be on the lookout for as well is that uh, it's not just 501c3 nonprofits that might have limitations, but any tax exempt use. So be on the lookout for whether you have a nonprofit or government owned member of your ownership group or use related to the ownership group or a prior owner and you're only leasing the property from them. All, all of those are things that should prompt you to call your experienced tax credit counsel. Uh, next question we've received, I've been told that an investor must be at risk to take advantage of the historic tax credits. In order to be at risk, one cannot generally use an LLC to hold the building. Does this mean that only real estate professionals or developers can use an LLC ownership structure to use the historic tax credits? So that, that's an excellent question. And some of those rules, I guess technical, have more to do with being an individual that owns the building and being your ability to claim the historic tax credit. So this kind of comes back full circle with Laura's 
opening presentation opening of the presentation talking about monetizing the historic tax credit because once you set up the legal structure necessary to monetize the credits and you essentially find the partner that's going to invest in them typically they're a bank or an insurance company or they're a c corporation not to get too technical isn't subject to the same rules under the tax code that an individual is so those rules so if you renovate a historic building yourself when you're main street and you want to claim the credits yourself that's definitely a conversation that you need to have with your accountant and your attorney because there's a lot of complex individual tax situations that can arise that can uh, prohibit an individual from claiming the credit and there are exceptions for people who identify as a real estate professional for the profession but again when you need individual tax advice like that it is definitely important that you consult your accountant or your attorney I'll add to that too that you know, both in, in addition to the at-risk rules and the passive activity rules that William hinted at, um, this is why the credit is set up so it can be allocated to other investors, that there is a capital formation opportunity as well as an opportunity for developers to offset their own tax liability with the credits generated. So you can really take either fork in the road. You could theoretically even do both. You could keep some of the credits and you could syndicate some of the credits to other individuals. So since the credits follow the profits interest in the entity that's going to own the property or can take advantage of the lease pass-through structure that we'll talk about in our next webinar, you have quite a bit of flexibility to make sure that the entity or entities that take the tax credits can use them, um, since not everybody can because of the way the general tax rules are written. Uh, next question is, uh, what is the typical timeline to close with a historic tax credit investor? It's a good question. So in terms of timing, the most important thing is that the project be in a position to close. So this means that, one, you're on the National Register, you're contributing building to a historic district, you have your Part 1 approval. Two, you have your Part 2 approval from the MPS, which indicates to the investor that assuming you follow along the plans and specs that have been approved by the Park Service, it gives the investor comfort that you're going to qualify for the historic tax credit. And then three, you need to have the remaining sources of financing lined up to complete the project because the investor doesn't earn the historic credit until the project places into service. So there needs to be some certainty that the project is going to get built and the year in which it is going to get built. Once those three items are satisfied, the typical timeline of close Sorry, the typical timeline associated with closing would probably be 45 days to 60 days, maybe up to 90 on the higher end, depending on the complexity of the project. But the process is very similar to closing on a construction loan, whereas you still have the similar due diligence associated with that, such as environmental title survey, things of that nature that an investor is going to need or that your bank would typically need to get a construction loan. And so that all leads into the lead times or those lead time items, along with things like an appraisal, can all add up to, say, 45, 60 days. William, how long did it take you to close the deal you closed on Monday? That one was a little bit more unique. It was not in a main street. That one took um, about a shade under a year. I don't want to scare anyone on the phone here. But why? But this one, ready. yeah, this one was not ready. They did not have, you know, they... They did not have everything they needed to, to be in a position to close quickly, and maybe they got a little too ahead of their skis in terms of engaging us at the time to monetize their tax credits. That said, they're a great partner of ours. We're looking forward to it in case they're on this phone, and uh, we're very excited here. I think a great question to end on uh, would be, what does the day-to-day -day Main Street practitioner need to take away from today? Also a great question. I, I would I would encourage Main Street practitioners to recognize that there are existing tools um, that could be utilized for redevelopment in your community. Not every tool is a fit for every single project, um, but recognizing that depending on what state you're in and whether you have access to state resources, whether your Main Street is located in the low income census tract and is available to get uh, new markets tax credit allocation. Um, there, there are things about your particular main street that are going to vary. And so being able to assess what you have that's a resource 
that will enable you to plug in to different state or federal incentives that can bring capital um, is something that's critically important. We certainly hope to be a resource for folks if you are in a qualified uh, low-income community that is new markets eligible and you're redeveloping a historic property. Our Main Street Small Deal Fund is specifically targeted for smaller projects that are in the five to eight million dollar total development cost range, not the not just projects that we're doing that are hundred million dollar transactions. Um, so we certainly encourage folks to reach out to us if they have more questions. Yeah, and just to follow up on Merrill's comment, sometimes this stuff can seem daunting and complicated, but People like us do it every day. There's professionals just every day. So just really like anything in life, you got to surround yourself with the right people and smart people that know what they're doing. And um, that'll make things a, a lot easier and cause a lot less headaches in terms of pursuing either monetizing historic tax credits or going after new market tax credit allocation. Great. Thank you. I, I want to thank uh, everyone who joined us today for taking the time out of your day um, to be a part of this webinar. Um, as a reminder, um, this is the first of three in our webinar series, um, Investing in Your Main Street. Our next event will be on April 11th uh, at 1 p.m. Eastern Time, um, where we will focus, we'll do a deeper dive into the New Markets Tax Credit Program and how the Main Street Revitalization Fund can support projects directly in Main Street communities. Uh, if anyone will be joining us next week in Seattle uh, for the Main Street Now Conference, be sure to check out um, the Tax Credit Financing Show Me the Money seminar, as well as the Land of Oz, Pulling Back the Curtain in Opportunity Zones. Merrill, uh, Merrill our, uh, the president of NTCIC, will be um, one of the panelists there. And finally, um, we will be conducting a annual community impact survey that will be available beginning this Monday. Um, we're very interested to find out directly from uh, Main Street and community members across the country the types of projects that they need in their communities, the types of assets that will best serve their communities. Uh, and with that, I want to remind you that um, we will provide a recorded copy of this webinar as well as the, the written handouts. Um, we'll send that to everybody, um, and we hope to see you on April 11th. Thank you very much.